Okay, so this is Dr. Todd Shaw's um, African American Studies 201 Introduction to uh, African American Politics course, Social and Historical Foundations. Uh, and I am lecturing on topic two, the race problem and black double consciousness. So what I'm gonna do, as I said to you class, is lecture more on the second part of this lecture or present more of the second part of this lecture because we've already gone through the first part. But just as a point of review, I want to at least go through a couple of the slides to refresh your memory about points I raised. And once you view this lecture, then there are some questions I want you to answer online. Again, mostly directed toward the second part of the lecture, but um, certainly you can use material from this lecture or other parts of the course. So I, as you recall, I kind of retitled this lecture and the point of retitling the lecture is to make it a little bit more uh, or better reflect what I'm actually going to discuss, particularly with regards to the readings we'll have with Maria Stewart, W.B. Du Bois, and Ta-Nehisi Coates. But what I didn't do in presenting this lecture previously is read two poems that I think are relevant to, you know, what I'm going to discuss because those poems speak to this notion of double consciousness. And so the first poem comes from the poet uh, County Cullen uh, and it's entitled Heritage. He wrote it in 1925 and County Cullen uh, was what we consider one of the signature poets of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, led a very interesting life uh, and we can get into a few more details about that life uh, when we get to that section on the Harlem Renaissance. But Cullen wrote this poem sort of as a reflection of one aspect of the double consciousness of black America. And you know double consciousness is Du Bois's idea that of trying to reconcile the American side of black identity with the African or black side um, of that identity. And Cullen wrote, what is Africa to me? Copper sun or scarlet sea? Jungle star or jungle track? Strong bronze men or regal black? Women from whose loins I sprang when the birds of Eden sang? One three centuries removed from the scenes his fathers loved. Spicy grove, cinnamon tree, what is Africa to me? And we'll raise this question throughout aspects of this lecture, particularly given that we're gonna be discussing and stressing the um, ways in which Africa versus America is an answer to the double consciousness dilemma. But Langston Hughes stressed the American side, and I'm sure you've heard of this poem before when he says, I too am America. He says, I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow I will be at the table when company comes. Nobody dare say to me, eat in the kitchen, then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. Okay, so let me just sort of get into a couple of these uh, points with regards to uh, that I previously raised. So the, remember the objective of this lecture is to talk about double consciousness and to discuss the how that double consciousness is swung between the poles of Africa versus America and in what ways African Americans have tried to reconcile the, these two poles uh, and, and particularly at the end where I'll where at the first part of the lecture we discuss revisiting the race problem and define race more formally in the class I'm going to come around now to discussing the double consciousness problem uh, and how Africa is an answer to that double consciousness question or stressing America is an answer to that doubleness, uh, double consciousness question and then in what ways did Du Bois provide his own answer or Du Bois provide what he saw as the answer to reconciling those two warring ideals. If you recall from last time, I defined formally what is 
racism or what excuse me what is race as a as a concept as a biological um myth and really that race is an idea it's a historical and cultural understanding and and not a biological or scientific scientifically verifiable distinction uh, in all of the respects in which we think of it we can get into a little bit of how it is able to how we are able to map individually individuals by their genome and where aspects of their of their gene pool likely derive from on the planet earth and correlate that with ethnic distinctions in those particular geographic areas but that's different from saying i can isolate that a person is all one thing or another in some respects and i won't go into the, any more of the details than that but um again more the consensus that race is a cultural understanding than it is a scientific uh, reality then i define racism and we had a good discussion as recall about what is racism i define white supremacy we we, we thought talked about that concept and then i define white nationalism Next, we got into discussions about colorism, the internalized um, or how in ways racism can be internalized. These, dis these distinctions or markers of difference, whether it be skin color or the physiognomy, uh, physiognomy, the facial features, hair texture, you know, language, affect, all of these things that are outward markers, but particularly markers upon the body, how these body markers per se race, uh, you know, skin color, you know, hair texture, et cetera, et cetera. How we use them in, as cues to distinguish now unconsciously, but often through American history, very, very consciously, the markers of inferiority and superiority among um, human populations and particularly among residents and citizens of the United States. Uh, and so, I got into colorism, I got into the research on colorism and, and how there's some evidence from the work of, of Jennifer Hochschild, Veshla Weaver. Uh, and then I also got into, as you recall, some general evidence uh, look, looking at these uh, statistics uh, where of the, of the economic and educational and poverty outcomes of individuals just based upon them distinguishing whether they, in the census, mark the box of white only, white and black, or black only. Um, at some point in class, we certainly could talk about other distinctions such as Asian only and white and Asian only. Although, if you look, go back and look at my lecture notes, as I'll, I'll release them to you, there's an interesting pattern that, that reveals itself there, uh, as was true for the other figures we did go over. Then I discussed the criminal justice system as an example of this question of the race problem. And by the way, I take that that finger quotes of the race problem directly from Du Bois's first chapter of the Souls of Black Folk of our spiritual striving. So the race problem, um, or D Du Bois would have said that back then it was defined as the Negro problem, when really Du Bois said, no, it's not the Negro problem, it's the race problem um, or, or the problem that are that's imposed upon Negro people. So criminal justice was, is certainly a example of these inequalities of race in America. Uh, you know, I, I talked briefly about the, the work of Michelle Alexander, among others who study race and crime in the criminal justice system uh, and how the new Jim Crow, as she uh, marks, as she, as she discusses it, that concept uh, which is the title of, of her um, um, award-winning book uh, is really uh, about the ways in which the mass, mass system of mass incarceration has prompted a new crisis that is very similar to, or, or a structure of inequality, very similar to Jim Crow racism. Then we discussed sort of the criminal justice employment in the criminal justice system or in the law enforcement system and how African-Americans are more likely to be at the ends um, of that system with regards to status in the system, you know, judges and magistrates on one side and then bailiffs, correctional officers and jailers on the other side and African-Americans being 
most represented in on the at the lower ranks of those who are employed in the systems of law enforcement. Uh, discuss Michael Tonry's quote uh, about the ways in which if in fact we had lesser rates of incarceration or we maintain rates of incarceration that were true to the 1970s or 1980s level, we would have only a half or a quarter of the persons in who are African American would be in jail presently if we maintain the same rate. So something happened in the late 70s, 1980s into the 1990s that saw a, a mushroom or explosion in the growth of the number of persons incarcerated in the United States. Uh, and certainly one cue to why that occurred is the criminalization of drugs, of, of narcotics use, or, or the, the, uh, cr the further criminalization of the use of drugs. And so on one side, remember from our good class discussion, we discussed this idea that the U.S. population, uh, African Americans make up roughly, you know, 10 to 12 or 13 percent of the U.S. population, whites uh, less than 70 percent. And those are the same rates at which whites comprise of the monthly drug users that are documented in the work here, Bobo and, and Thompson, uh, and roughly the same rate for African Americans. So there's a proportional this proportionality between percentage of the population of blacks and whites and the percentages they comprise of, of monthly drug users or, or reported monthly drug use. But when you look at drug arrest, whites are, 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 are roughly a little less likely than their per percentage in the population to be arrested for drugs. Um, African Americans are about twice as more likely uh, than when you get to drug conviction, um, um, the percentage of those who are convicted for drugs, uh, that means that whites are only about two thirds likely of their percentage of the population. African Americans, again, are more than twice as likely. And then you look at uh, those who are not just convicted, but are sentenced in state prisons. Whites only make up a third of that population. You know, 70% of the monthly drug use, but a third of those who are sentenced for the crime and African Americans are only 10% of those, of the total percentage of those who are, um, have, uh, you know, comprise monthly drug users, but are almost half of those sentenced for the crime. Okay, so let me get into what's the newer material in this lecture. So, this then kind of leads me down to the conclusion of race still matters. Uh, and as you and I will discuss, and I don't, I don't think you're surprised by that conclusion at all, uh, as you and I will discuss and have discussed already, we certainly intersect race with other factors that have a bearing upon African American communities. So race matters when it comes to questions of ongoing discrimination, but so do class and gender. I'm taking two charts from the, the Pew Research Center. Uh, and one and b both of these studies were conducted um, earlier this year of 2019 and from January to February of 2019. So a majority of blacks say they face discrimination according to this Pew study, but those with college experience are more likely to say this. So the percentage of blacks by educational attainment who say they have personally experienced discrimination or been treated unfairly because of their race or ethnicity. Among all African Americans, uh, about a third, uh, excuse me, about 13% regularly say they face discrimination and about 63% from time to time, which altogether is 76% of African Americans saying they experience some or occasional or regular discrimination. But when you look at those African Americans who had high school or less education in this survey versus some college or more, those who had some college or more had um, a, a, a greater likelihood than those who had uh, college, high school or less. And so 19 versus 17 percent and then 60 percent versus 64 percent, a slight difference um, uh, from time to time. So 69 percent among those who have high school or less in terms of education, or, and, but among college or more, 81%. We'll discuss in class. Why do you think this is? 
Uh, then for black men, for black men are far more likely than black women to say they've been unfairly stopped by the police. Although I, we will get into how is race and racism gendered in different ways. What's the types of, of racism or discrimination African-American women are more likely to face than true for African-American men and vice versa. But people acted like they were sup suspicious of them. People acted as if they were not smart. Uh, been subject to slurs or jokes, been treated unfairly in hiring, uh, pay or promotion, feared for their personal safety, been unfairly stopped by the police and police and people assumed they were racist or prejudiced. Uh, and so in each of these cases, men are a little bit more likely to quite a bit more likely to uh, perceive unfair treatment or, or racial discrimination than are true for African American women. Is it is this in p objectively the case? Is it a matter of perception as colored by gender? Um, are both true? We'll get into that. So let's revisit or more uh, directly visit double consciousness. And as you know, this comes from uh, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, William Edward, uh, William, um, um, uh, excuse me, uh, 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 William Edward de Bo um, Bogart Du Bois. I'm sorry, I'm stumbling on <laughs> all of the initials in W.E.B. Uh, William Edward Bo Bogart Du Bois, uh, The Souls of Black Folks, 1903. Uh, and in that book, Du Bois says, it is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, the sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in the amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro slash African, um, two warring souls, two thoughts, two unre unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals and one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. So, so as I had said in an earlier class, Du Bois used this concept. It's not unique to Du Bois. Um, in some ways, Du Bois borrowed it from aspects of, of German uh, philosophical and psychological thinking, uh, to, but applied it to the African-American context. Um, and Du Bois studied in Ber Berlin for a while before um, also, of course, studying at, at Harvard and um, then teaching, taking teaching positions um, at Fisk University, at Atlanta University at all. But, but Du Bois, in applying this concept, says it clearly relates to this African-Americans in the sense of these two warring ideals. And so let's unpack these two warring ideals and deal with them separately. Uh, and think about are, which one of these ideals might be the answer to solving the double consciousness dilemma, the double consciousness tension, uh, to, to lessen the, the conflict between these two ideals. Should it be a, ma a matter of African Americans stressing the African or black side of that identity or the American uh, side of that identity? Okay, so let's think about Africa as an answer. Um, as you know, the African continent is one of immense diversity, uh, and you know the uh, continent itself has immense diversity with regards to the language groups that comprise it. And I'm just showing some of the major language groups. Some 2,000 languages are spoken um, in uh, throughout this continent. Uh, as you know, 61 territories or 53 countries comprise this continent. Um, and we'll go through uh, aspects of how this enormous diversity uh, likewise contributes to African-Americans' conceptions of this continent and romanticization of this continent, or even at times, demonization of the continent of Africa. We'll also get into, and we also have already discussed, uh, I think we began to discuss with uh, the Painter chapter, the ways in which African Americans have used Egypt, or as Painter also says, sort of interchangeably use the concept of Ethiopia and Egypt, these classical civilizations or kingdoms, these classical uh, sort of 
royal civilizations uh, as a stand-in for this idea of being linked to something greater than slavery, something greater than, than, than Jim Crow racism, something later than institutional racism and racial inequality, to say that we're, uh, these origins of, a, of an African past are rooted in this greatness uh, and not just rooted in, in pain and in oppression. And so, particularly when we think about the, the romanticization, not just the romanticization, but the actual history of African kings and queens. Uh, and we'll get into how Painter believes there's both a, a, a very positive aspect to this history, but then also a sort of problematic aspect to this history of, of always romanticizing and always saying, let's focus on the kings and queens as opposed to those who did their ordinary day, day labor and who were themselves enslaved in these kingdoms. But beyond that, um, how it is important to recover this history uh, and, to, and to be aware of this history. And I'm showing you this picture that came from the National Geographic discussing the, the black pharaohs of Egypt uh, and emphasis upon the 25th dynasty of Egypt. I've already talked a little bit about the, the modern day Nubia or Kush and Moreau and Aksum uh, and the contributions of these individuals uh, who would have, in our own sort of thinking, would have been, we would have classified as black and sat upon the Egyptian throne. Uh, and then we can discuss sort of the other aspects of this history. Um, often uh, when there's discussion between the African queens, kings and queens heritage or legacy of black Americans, uh, there's a discussion of kings and queens such as Mansa Musa. Uh, Mansa Musa uh, was the um, sort of king of kings or, or in some ways it's not quite a title but uh, that we would think, but sort of the emperor. Of the, of the kingdom of, of Mali, of the, of, of the emperor of the Malian empire and, uh, and reigned for 20 years um, beginning in the, in the year 1307. Uh, and the enormous wealth of this kingdom uh, or the empire of Mali uh, was uh, sort of categorized in that day as, uh, and recognized in that day uh, as being of, a, uh, of, so of such great significance uh, that uh, Mansa Musa, when he being of the um, Islamic faith, of the, this is the Muslim influence in the Muslim or Islamic um, invasion of aspects of the, um, of, of, um, or the invasion. And then I should also say, so the acculturation and mixture of the Islamic world with, the, the, with North African uh, civilizations when Mansa Musa took a pilgrimage uh, to uh, Mecca uh, on his uh, holy Hajj to Mecca, and he took so many, he took so many retainers, such a uh, enormous entourage, and took so much gold with him. It is uh, been rumored in that day that he that the entire uh, use of gold was devalued. He devalued the gold as a form of currency because he introduced and flooded so much gold onto world markets uh, as a display of his wealth. Uh, and at one point, Ghana would have been part of this uh, Malian empire, and thus it, um, in, in Ghana was known as the Gold Coast, given the, uh, the, the way in which that precious metal uh, was in predominant use in Ghana. So, as, as points of summary, uh, you know, Africa is a diverse continent and it's the birthplace of human civilization, uh, civilization or hu humankind. Um, Africa is diverse both in climate and people. A third of it is desert and most of the population resides in sub-Saharan grasslands. Approximately 2,000 languages are spoken and some 800 ethnic groups exist. Homo erectus, uh, the first sort of, uh, sort of, you know, the variation in terms of the, uh, of humankind, of human, of the evolve, evolving um, uh, aspects of, of Homo sapien life was found there some 1.6 million years ago in human settlements about 200,000 years ago. So um, Africa is the motherland, if you will, of not just people of African descent, but Africa is a motherland of human civilization and humankind.
uh, ancient and West African civilizations. Again, I'm just as a recap for all of the debates about the blackness of Egypt, which is a very important debate that Afrocentrists and others have raised. We know that modern day Nubia, Kush, Moro, and Aksum from about uh, 540 BCE to about um, the 8th century ACE, so before Christ, or before the Christian era and after the Christian era, or the 25th dynasty, they, it was composed of quote unquote black pharaohs who sat upon the Egyptian throne. Uh, and there's a very a interesting aspect to the ways in which these uh, Nubian uh, kings of Egypt uh, ruled. Uh, and then what is the connection that African Americans have? Well, if we think about sort of the ways in which West Africa more is, is West and Central Africa are more predominantly the regions where African Americans ancestors would have derived where the slave trade uh, the European slave trade took place in the triangular trade and transported individuals away there emerged between about 300 AD to about 1590 AD three powerful and large empires of, of Ghana Mali and Songhai uh, each were influenced by Islam, but built upon military power and trade, uh, including internal and external slave trade. Uh, and Painter ch challenges the view that the descendants from kings and queens um, is, the, is always the best approach to realistically understanding this history. Um, again, there was an internal African slave trade quite different from what would evolve as what we call the sort of European or Anglo-American chattel slave trade, pro, uh, mo most, uh, the most important difference being the rights of those who were enslaved, where did they have the ability to uh, be freed from slavery and become part of the larger citizenry or, the, or, or have, retain rights, or were they forever enslaved and there was a forever a color bar, bar in distinction between slave and un enslaved? A little bit more on that later. Okay, so let's continue to discuss sort of Africa as an ancestor, or excuse me, Africa, well, Africa as a, is an ancestor, but Africa as an answer, and think about modern, uh, you know, uh, modern ways in which African Americans have made this connection, and particularly within the early 20th century into now the 21st century connections between uh, African Americans and Africa. And here I'm showing you pictures of Marcus Garvey, and we'll talk more about Garvey. We, I mentioned him already, uh, but M Marcus Garvey and the ways in which his Pan-Africanist movement, his, his movement of Pan-Africanism wanted to connect um, um, people of African descent in the diaspora back to Africa as this great civilization. You'll notice, of course, that Garvey is wearing not a, a what we would necessarily associate as, uh, as sort of an African um, attire, but he is wearing the the uniform of a British field marshal of a of, of a British military officer, and Garvey used aspects of sort of European symbols or Eurocentric symbols, as some might uh, label them, with these African ideals, because Garvey said, "I understand that." you understand these symbols as being powerful. So I will wear them to demonstrate that that Africa and Africans had empires that equaled, equaled European empires. Um, some would argue it was problematic of Garvey, others would say it's masterful. We'll get into that discussion. Clearly the next picture is of Malcolm X um, and he is wearing an African daishiki. And Malcolm X made an appeal to well, a new organization called the uh, Organization of Afri African Unity, the OAU. Uh, and uh, he was trying to very directly link what he said um, um, the, where the, uh, and, and, and Malcolm X would use the term Afro-Americans or, or African-Americans here in North America with their African cousins on the African continent. Malcolm preached for a connection between the struggles. Um, he said from, uh, Malcolm would later speak about from Congo, Mississippi to the Congo. <laughs> and so in what ways to make these direct connections and in particularly to 
indict the United States in uh, the tribunals uh, of the United Nations to, to indict the United States on human rights violations for slavery and from separating the ties between Africans um, and their African-American uh, brothers and sisters. Standing next to Malcolm X, you probably can't quite, you may not be able to recognize, but that is a very young uh, uh, Maya Angelou, the, uh, the uh, brilliant uh, poet Ma Maya Angelou, uh, who was very, very much in admiration to what Malcolm uh, was trying to do. And she and her generation were admiring what Malcolm was trying to accomplish and making this revived connection. But Malcolm was inspired in part by Garvey um, and in, in each successive generation in trying to make this connection to Africa. Then in the third picture, you see a picture of Coretta Scott King um, and she, as she led a protest in front of the South African embassy in the 1980s in the Free South Africa movement, um, protesting African-American apartheid. This is yet another example of when African-Americans were making this tie to Africa and making an argument about how uh, South African apartheid sounded all too eerily familiar with Jim Crow racism. Uh, and in fact, uh, the work of George Fredrickson makes such a case <laughs> of the ties between one form of racial oppression and the other as, as separated by uh, these different continents or, or on these different continents. But it was also during this period where the term African-American uh, had its greater usage. And really, it was about a foreign policy linkage between people of African descent here in North America and upon the African continent and, and the political solidarity around that. And then lastly, as I know you know, that's Barack Obama. And he is standing next to his, his grandmother um, because Obama is of the Obamas of, uh, of, of um, Kenya. And uh, so there are direct ties and linkages uh, that some African-Americans can still make, uh, but many cannot. Um, and I'm gonna show you during class time the, the um, period where, or, or, the, or the link where the Obamas visited Elmina Castle uh, in modern day Ghana. And we're, we're gonna do a, a unit on that uh, later on when we look at the film Sankofa. Okay, so let's talk about a broader concept that each of these pictures at these different points in 20th and 21st century history conveyed. And the, and the broader point will raise, or the broader concept will raise is that of Pan-Africanism. Uh, Pan-African is a belief and practice that all persons of African descent share commonalities and thus should act in unity to promote the common interest of African peoples and of the African motherland. So it is a sort of cultural, social, and historical sense of ties. It's, uh, it's if you will, it's the a, a broad sense of link fate, as I've used that term, uh, between peoples of African descent uh, and it's, of course, rooted in this common heritage uh, and this common origin and in, in, in being descendants of Africa. Now, pan-Africanism as an ide ideology, I would argue, is actually broader than black nationalism. Um, black nationalism, as you recall, is the belief and practice that black people or African Americans must seek freedom, liberation through political, economic, or cultural independence or autonomy from white America. So the sense of being a black and independent black nation. Um, Pan-Africanism is broader in the sense that is it doesn't speak just to what is true in North America per se, and black nationalism doesn't always do that either, but, but, but typically Pan-Africanism speaks in the broadest sense across all people of African descent. So people who have African ancestry in Colombia or um, in Great Britain or in uh, Columbia, South Carolina or in Ghana, the linkages between all of those individuals. Afrocentrism, uh, and I, we discussed Afrocentrism, uh, is both Pan-Africanist and Black nationalist. So it can be both dependent upon what form of Afrocentrism we're, we're referring to. Are African Americans natural pan-Africanist? By that I mean that African Americans have long been attracted to, to and at times fearful of reconnecting to their African past. 
So because so many African Americans, unlike Barack Obama, who can directly trace his family, his family ties um, to the African continent by way of Kenya, most African Americans cannot do that, can maybe take the, uh, a genetic uh, test to link broadly to a grouping of people there. <clears throat> but can't say directly because of the vestiges of slavery and the, and, and the memory and ties that slavery destroyed, can't directly say, oh, my, my family is from or descended from this particular group or particular um, ethnic group within a particular nation. And so in some ways, like Garvey, African Americans then just claim it all. <laughs> Say, in fact, well, we're all it, it. All of Africa is connected to me, or I'm connected to all of Africa. I have some linkage to all of these peoples, um, and so that's different than saying I demonize and don't want to be connected to. Remember that the 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 racial slur we talked about earlier of this notion of the being black African as a bad thing. Uh, that's the distancing away from those ties, which is quite different. Okay, so this is map just sort of portrays what we've talked about earlier, which is, although we talk a lot in this class, of course, about the ways in which African Americans descended from Africa, uh, quite, you know, by definition, um, the, the triangular trade, which we will get into more when we discuss the slavery um, and, and African enslavement, uh, transported the largest number of persons of African descent not to North America, but to, as we've said earlier, South and Central America. So uh, this chart is uh, from Curtin, is showing you that North America in this time period uh, received about four, 400,000 um, um, Africans, and this would have, this would have been roughly by the late 17 or the mid 1700s, I believe, about the mid or late 1700s. Uh, Mexico and Central America received 200,000, whereas the West Indies received 4 million. Spanish South America, uh, uh, about half a million. Uh, the the Guyana, half a million. Brazil, three million. Uh, or almost 4 million, and then Europe about, uh, still about um, a little less than 200,000. So again, all of these combined meant that the larger populations of persons of African descent, even when you account for the birth rates over several centuries, all of these nations started with a larger base of population to begin with the people of African descent. And so thus, even though as powerful as America is, and thus, the great influence African Americans and African American culture have upon the world and the African diaspora. Still, the largest percentage of the African uh, diaspora or the dispersions of African uh, of pe people of African descent are be to be found in North and Central America. Excuse me, Central and South America. All right. Now, these connections of between African Americans and Africa mattered fundamentally uh, and have mattered f fundamentally across the African-American experience and particularly the African-American intellectual experience. W.E.B. Du Bois resolved this double consciousness dilemma for himself. How did he do it? Um, in his, in, in his, by age 93, Du Bois moved to Ghana, West Africa, for most intents and purposes, renounced his American citizenship and started on the great project of, of the Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Africana. So Du Bois said, I'm gonna resolve this and I'm just gonna become African. <laughs> I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna embrace my African citizenship, my citizenship as invited by um, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, the president of, uh, of, or prime minister of Ghana. I'm just gonna move there. I'm gonna let them give me some resources to start this great project. Um, and distance myself from um, what has always been this fundamental struggle in, in North American America. Well, two other scholars uh, tried to work this out um, in ways that differed somewhat from Du Bois. Uh, and I want you to think of this as the sort of the broad scholarship within um, 
the, the, or the broad scholarship within African American studies, although the, they themselves have different connections to the African American community. So uh, one scholar being on the, on the right-hand side, Melville Herkovitz. Now, Melville Herkovitz was um, white and a Jewish American by his own ethnicity and ancestry. But Herkovitz came up with a very interesting set of propositions that said, actually, I think I can directly tie African Americans to their African heritage. And as a cultural anthropologist, I'm going to demonstrate these direct ties. In other words, I'm going to demonstrate Africanisms. That was Herkovitz's um, um, standpoint. On the other side, on the left side, is um, uh, E. Franklin Frazier. And E. Franklin Frazier says, Herkovitz, you're wrong. There are no direct ties between African Americans and Africa, not by looking directly at present day African American culture. Unfortunately, slavery was so brutal. So, sla slavery so eviscerated any memory of Africa that you really can't call what are these vestiges of the African American uh, of Africa within African American culture anything really significant. We we don't know what they are, and these ties are not significant enough. And it's not for not for the desire that African Americans might want to know, but you can't visit say that these these ties matter anymore in the sense that they, they directly link black Americans as an African people. So uh, what we're going to what I'm going to ask you to do is to say, OK, well, now let's go back to Du Bois. Uh, du Bois gave his own resolution to the problem <laughs> at the end of his life. But what was Du Bois? What did Du Bois mean in the souls of black folks by these three important concepts? And these are concepts I want you to look at your at the Du Bois uh, double consciousness reading. Uh, to derive the answers. First of all, what is double consciousness? What is the veil? And what does Du Bois consider the, the, the gifts that um, black folks gave to American culture? What are those gifts? Okay. Now, on the African side of the Africanisms debate. So let me just by way of definition define Africanisms. By Africanisms, we mean evidence that the descendants of those taken from Africa retained elements of their African culture through food, speech, music, religion, naming practices, etc. So are there evidences, and we here in South Carolina, by way of the Gullah culture, would probably say yes, <laughs> and so did Herkovitz. Um, and Herkovitz was not the only individual. We'll talk about others who are... Um, who were quite important to this study, uh, actually not far from us. Anyway, I'm sorry, <laughs> I got off topic. Anyway, so what are the evidences of this culture today? Can we trace these linkages today? Um, and that's what Africanisms, these African retentions mean. That's the definition. Again, Herkovitz says yes. Uh, and Melville Herkovitz, he was a he was a cultural anthropologist, studied at a number of years at Northwestern University, lived between 1895 and 1963. Um, it was of Jewish ancestry, and he was a founder of African studies. Now, I can unpack that a little bit more, but I won't right now. All right. So, in 1941, he wrote a book. In a very important book called The Myth of the Negro Past, and he argued African Americans retained Africanisms as evident from the cultures of the, the Sea Islands, the Georgia and South Carolina Sea Islands. Um, and of course, he was looking at Gullah culture or Gullah Geechee culture as the, as the evidences of these retentions. Thus, why South Carolina, just yet another reason why South Carolina is central to our understanding of African-American history and culture. All right, again, E. Franklin Frazier said no. 1894, he lived from 1894 to 1962. So you can see that these men's lives literally paralleled each other. He was a pioneering black sociologist and posthumously after his death, the book, The Negro Church in America was published in 1963 and it argued in it, uh, Frazier argued 
that slavery and its racism were so brutal that they stripped away all vestiges of African culture. Um, Franklin was uh, uh, trained in many universities, including my own alma mater, Howard University. Sorry, I've got to always bring it up when you hear it. Uh, but he would go on to teach, um, his, one of his final teaching gigs was at the very influential Atlanta University, which is also the same university that W.E.B. Du Bois taught at, at one point. All right, let's watch a, a, just a brief clip of a film about Herkovitz that will illustrate the, the, the sort of complexity of what he was trying to raise, but also the complexity of Herkovitz being the one to say it. Uh, and I'm going to let you view this film as one of your extra credit assignments uh, or on the list of extra credit films that you can watch. All right. Again, this is just a clip from or trailer from that documentary. What is a Negro? in the sense that the term is used in the United States. Obviously, one only has to look at the great degree of crossing, the tremendous variation in color that marks American Negroes. I hear the voice of Melville J. Herskovitz, and what I wonder is, how did a white man come to know so much about black people? Probably more than any other American, Melville Herskovitz is the person who demonstrates that African Americans are connected to Africans. He was a leading anthropologist of the 20th century, but he was also a kind of social paradox. If you look at Herskovitz through one angle, he sets the terms for our understanding of the relationship between Africa and black people in the Americas. From another angle, you might see him as someone who appropriates a certain kind of knowledge. From another angle, he's the son of Jewish immigrants and he's trying to sort out his own position in America. I always like to think of him as kind of the Elvis of African-American studies. On the one hand, you might think of someone like Elvis, as someone who takes things that blacks have already been doing, and he gets the credit for them. On the other hand, you can say, well, here's a guy who actually mainstreams rock and roll. Herskovitz mainstreams some of these ideas about the connections between African and African-American culture. Early anthropologists were committed to demonstrating that Black people were inferior. Many people believed black culture was a bad copy of white culture. Look, I, you know, if black people have been ignored, not listened to, uh, their part of the story is not being told for centuries, it's understandable that black scholars aren't waiting in line behind some white guy to tell the story <laughs> that they want to tell. What is a Negro in the sense that the term is used in the United States? Obviously. What does it mean to ask, what is a Negro? What is a Negro as a physical type? What is a Negro as an existential condition? What does the Negro want? How do we understand African-American belonging over time? Does the right to define and describe and observe a people give you power over those people? Does the right to really characterize a people to determine their fate? Okay, so I'll let you watch that documentary in its entirety um, but that's just to give you an interesting you know and an, 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 or to raise an interesting question about so who can do African-American studies <laughs> who is it required that one be African-American that you understand that experience in order to be a scholar of African-American studies um, I think given what this class has said earlier about when I asked the question about who can be a feminist and I said, can only women be feminist? Can a man be a feminist? I heard a loud no. So maybe I think you, you, you have, um, I know you have a complex understanding of that question, but we'll, but we'll, we'll get into that question a bit in our, our discussion. All right. So 
let's let's uh, continue on with our discussion of Africa as an answer. And let's do this from the standpoint of actually understanding that if we broaden the notion of Africanisms, we can talk about this concept as the contributions African Americans have made to American and Western culture uh, in broad respect, in, 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 a, in quite a few um, ways, in, in broad ways, not, um, well, and when I say broad ways, both big and small contributions. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about the Africanisms within um, uh, uh, Herman Melville's Moby Dick uh, novel. Uh, we'll talk about Africanisms or black contributions in unlikely places, like the uh, authorship of <laughs> the uh, Confederate anthem Dixie. Um, we'll talk about even in sort of po popular culture and in mass culture, uh, the, the use of certain African tropes in very unconscious ways, even in things like the Bugs Bunny cartoons. Um, and then the, the notion of what it means to be hip or hip hop. How does even that concept have a conceivable uh, African origins? Let me share the scholarship with you. All right, so Africanisms have also influenced American culture, not just African Americans per se. Let me give you a few examples. So in literature, did Herman Melville's novel Moby Dick, um, was it inspired by the West African Yoruba god Legba uh, and, uh, and what Melville um, but, you know, did Melville, uh, uh, in fact, borrow some concepts wittily or unwittily from African culture? Many, including Toni Morrison, have commented on the anti-racist metaphor of Herman Melville's classic Moby Dick novel. But Viola Sachs, Sterling Stuckey, and Eric Sundquist conclude that there were references to the Yoruba god Legba in Moby Dick. Like Captain Ahab, Legba appears as a shabby old man but he's really very clever and cunning. If you need to get a message to the gods, he's the one to go for, that's Legba. But like the great whale, Legba is not very reliable. He likes nothing better than to confuse you. It's likely that Melville knew something of the Ashanti people's drumming rituals in writing the story uh, Benito Sereno. And if Melville knew something about African culture in that context, might he, in writing that story, might he known, have known it also from Moby Dick? Again, Sachs, Stuckey, and Sunquist raised this as a question in, in their research. Then how about music? Was the song Dixie written by a black family, the Snowdens? Howard Sachs and Judith Rose Sachs argue convincingly that a 19th century black family in Ohio wrote Dixie, the song that became the anthem for the Confederacy. The, and the, that family was the Snowdens. Uh, uh, they build their case, the Sachs, the Sachs build their case uh, using family records, public documents, and oral histories. And they all capsulize this in a work entitled North and Dixie, a black family's claim to the Confederate anthem. So. The, the, the big and small, the conventional and unconventional ways in which black slash African influences have found their ways into aspects of American and Western culture. Again, these are all sort of things that make you go, hmm. Uh, then what of the folk tales? Do Bugs Bunny or Br'er Rabbit come from the Wolof people of Senegal's folk tales? Uh, the so, uh, excuse me, Joe Adamson and David Rodeker in their 1994 essay explored the African roots of Bugs Bunny. Bugs' heritage is anything but white. The verb bugs, as in annoy or vexes, helps name the cartoon hero. Its roots may lie in the speech of the Wol Wolof people of Senegal. Moreover, the fantastic idea that a vulnerable and weak rabbit could be tough and, trick enough, and, 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 and tricky enough to menace, those, uh, um, who, to menace those who are considered the, the more powerful. 
Again, this is a, a concept of the trickster figure found in not just uh, this um, American folk tales, as by Chandler um, um, Harris and, and other American writers, but also found in African folk tales. Uh, Anasi the Spider is, a, 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 again, a West African trickster figure. How did these stories, how might they have been conveyed from the African context to the American context in ways seen and unseen. And then words like hip, does it come from the Wolof word hippie that means to be aware? Thus hip, hippies, hip hop, etc. <laughs> Might they have some uh, unbeknownst roots in, in this uh, African origin? Uh, Pearson, Phillips, Abramson, and, uh, and Rodiger also noted that the African roots to the words hip derive from this uh, Wolof term. Rodiger writes, the hip and hip hop in, is in so much as a modern U.S. culture was there, uh, was it put there by Africans. As the extraordinary research by David Dalby and others has shown, enslaved Wolof speakers from what is now Senegal probably carried hippie, meaning to open one's eyes to be aware of what is going on, to the New World as early as the late 1600s. Even the beatnik ideal of the hep cat echoed the Wolof hippocot, meaning someone's with eyes open. The men of, of whites in the 1960s America who searched out eye-opening experiences as hippies might have adopted the name because it grew out of a culture permeated with African influence, although they did not know it. So again, these are just all small things to make you go, hmm, and there are larger contributions that we will also talk about, of course. Uh, but, you know, you, you know, in this course, I wanted you to at least be aware of the aspects in which art and culture fundamentally matter, although we focus a lot upon history the, the social aspects and sociological and, 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 and social interactions, and of course, politics and political science. And then certainly food waves. Uh, and uh, when uh, Dr. Kimberly Simmons offers the course again, think of, talk, think of taking her African and African-American food waste course. So certainly versions of the yam and rice and sweet potatoes um, have their African contributions. There's a reason why African-American uh, cuisine or soul food and Southern cooking have such enor have enormous parallels. <laughs> they have those enormous parallels because of the enslaved African-American cooks who would have done that cooking and have introduced that cuisine and influenced Southern culture, um, you know, you know, made the contributions that they did. <laughs> so. Again, even in food ways and folk tales and literature and music, all these ways in which um, the African influences show up. And, and so um, uh, Holloway, Holloway, in his 1990 book on African, Africanisms and African-American culture and American culture, talks about, was it actually the Bantu people of Central Africa that had as much an influence upon African-American culture as was true of West Africa? So he says, many assume that West Africa is the primary source of black American Africanisms, like uh, the nations of Sierra Leone or, or Ghana. But he says that the Bantu peoples of Central Africa, such as the Congo, were more unified. Uh, so uh, the Ang uh, Angola Congo regions of, of the Central Africa, they were more unified or were able to maintain their, their aspects of their culture uh, in more concrete ways. And did this more directly shape uh, black Africanisms than, than might be true of all the elements of West African culture? Anyway, Holloway raises it as an interesting question, but it is true that African-Americans in some ways are innate Pan-Africanists because black culture is a mixture of many African cultures. All right. So, now, we've dealt with the African answer to the double consciousness dilemma. Let's talk about the American answer. So one of my f favorite films, and you'll know this because I'll play a clip from it, is the 1989 film Glory. And that film portrays the life and times of the Massachusetts 
54th Negro Regiment of the of the Union Army, uh, and the 54th Massachusetts Regiment was the first um, regiment, all black regiment raised among African American troops. You know, President Lincoln authorized African Americans to be finally uh, enlisted into the Union Army of, of in the Civil War conflict, uh, and so this re this this regiment led by uh, um, Gould Shaw, no relation to me, <laughs> but uh, Robert Gould Shaw led this regiment uh, of the 54th Massachusetts. And, um, you know, uh, Matthew Broderick, uh, Denzel Washington, and Morgan Freeman played the main uh, characters within this drama. Now, the film Glory takes some historical license with aspects of what actually happened with that troop and with that battalion, or with, the, with that regiment. But I, I always thought that that film did um, capture the essence of what does it mean for an African American uh, community to fight in a war that originally was not designated as the war of its emancipation and freedom, but becomes that out of mil military necessity. What did what would those men and the and the women and children and the communities that supported them? What would they have been feeling and the sentiment they would have been feeling to fight for this newfound freedom, this investment, this blood, sweat, and toil investment in freedom, um, in this new concept of America, an America where we are free. Uh, and so that's why I raise glory um, as a modern day aspect of that investment of what it means for African Americans to be uh, American. But let's take from the actual historical record a, a few important examples. In the life and times of Martin Delaney. So during the, uh, Martin Delaney and, and Henry McNeil Turner, uh, and this is during the Reconstruction period uh, after the Civil War, uh, which, you know, I'll say is roughly, roughly speaking, between 1867 to 1877, roughly speaking. Uh, and the hope that African Americans vested or didn't invest in America after this great Civil War and the, the prospect of, of emancipation and first citizenship brought about by that Civil War and these constitutional amendments uh, that came as a result. So Martin Delaney, who lived from 1812 to 1885, once advocated a return to Africa. Martin Delaney is, um, is really sort of among the modern fathers of Pan-Africanism, the idea of returning back to Africa, phrases that, Af that Delaney would coin, like Africa for Africa, Africa for Africans, a home and abroad. Delaney's language would directly influence the thinking of Marcus Garvey. But during the Civil War itself, Martin Delaney fought in the Union Army, was a commissioned um, uh, officer in, the, in, in, in um, the Civil War, among, fighting among black, uh, black regiments. And so he became a Reconstruction uh, an official within the Re Reconstruction government uh, after the Civil War. And in sense then, Delaney somewhat turned away, didn't completely ignore, but somewhat turned away from this answer of let us return back to Africa, but then instead worked to for this new American Republic to bring about black freedom. That's somewhat of the flip side of the Honorable uh, Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, a bishop within the African Methodist uh, Episcopal Church who lived from 1833 and then died in 1915, which is significant. That's the year uh, Booker T. Washington died, and that's a year prior to Marcus Garvey founding the UNIA. But um, McNeil Turner was elected to the Georgia legislature um, as part of the Reconstruction government of the state of Georgia. But the White Democrats in Georgia, who were f who were the connect, who were the former, uh, uh, who would have um, eventually, or, or were former Confederates, or if they weren't former Confederates, they were certainly sympathetic, or, or could have been sympathetic to the Confederate cause, and certainly many of them may have been former slave masters. Eventually, when they resumed control of the government. Um, 
in the state legislature of Georgia, literally threw out McNeil Turner and other black legislatures refusing to seat them in the Georgia legislature and, per, and, and refusing to let these black men be part of the government. And, and McNeil Turner was so fundamentally turned off by this example of the, of the emergence of Jim Crow racism in the United States. He called the American flag a dirty rag <laughs> and called for a return to Africa because he saw no hope in America. So these are two stark examples um, of is America an answer? Was it in America an answer, particularly in this period of reconstruction and post reconstruction? Uh, and you could say that it, it, it follows along the lines of what one might call sort of uh, concept I call invested patriotism versus iconoclastic patriotism. Now, I'm giving you these three images at the bottom of the page here, African-American young man with the American flag draped over half of his shoulder, <laughs> African-American, uh, the way in which one is one half a citizen even still today, a second class citizen even today, uh, and is the young man pulling that flag further, further over his other shoulder or keeping it firmly in place or, or pushing it back off his shoulder. The, the dilemmas of being African-American. This image in the middle has always been so poignant to me because it was it comes from the the period right after or during the Hurricane Katrina disaster where the city was so ill-prepared, where actually all levels of government were so ill-prepared for that storm and the way in which that storm would wreak havoc, of, uh, havoc upon the city of New Orleans. Uh, that 80% of the city was flooded and 70% of those who were left behind were African American and or poor. And so this poignant image of this, Af this African American woman and her family being there at the Astrodome, because that was the high ground and the only place left for people to go. And the only thing left to drape her and her family in is the American flag. I bought that, that image is always torn at my heart because she's literally sitting there hoping on, waiting for the promise of America to save her, where she drapes the flag around her against the cold and against the, 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 the horrid conditions that were left during the storm. And then this image of the Indianapolis Colts um, and their management kneeling during the, the, the anthem, during the national anthem. And I know you know of the controversy around um, NFL players uh, of course, Colin Kaepernick being the most um, most outspoken voice in this protest movement that used this NFL moment or the moment of the playing of the national anthem to protest police violence. So all of these images portray what I call are the interesting dilemmas of invested versus iconoclastic patriotism. And at different points in American history, African Americans have swung between being invested patriots or invested in the sense of a devotion to a promised America due to the investments of sweat, sweat blood, and tears. So it, I, I like to think of it as a, the phrase that, that uh, Al Sharpton once used when he says, I believe in America like Ray Charles believes in America. <laughs> Ray Charles, who was, a, as you know, is a famous um, blind uh, R&B singer. He says Ray Charles would sing the song, uh, America, America the Be Beautiful. But he was singing about America he physically could not see. <laughs> he passionately believed in what he sang, but it was not America he could see. And so that, I think that's always a poignant sort of notion with regards to invested patriotism. It is not yet realized, and yet I believe passionately in th that this America will come, that it does exist. So that's one pole of what I call African-American poles of patriotism. On the other pole is iconoclastic patriotism, or it's an, like the NFL players kneeling. It's sort of a radical or somewhat radical commitment to make America face its racial flaws. So it is not that we don't believe in what you say is this American Republic and freedom and democracy. It is not that we don't believe it, but we know we are going to have to hold protest and hold your feet to the fire 
for that to come about. It is not going to come about simply because we wait patiently for it to come about. And so let me give you two quotes that kind of all also encapsulates this notion of invested in iconoclastic patriotism. On one side, Roger Wilkins says about invested patriotism in his book, Jefferson's Pillow, the writer Roger Wilkins. He says, generations of my family are buried in this American ground, and this country has made its mark on us just as we have made our marks on it. My people and I have worked for America, and we have changed it, made it richer and better. Later, he concludes, for me to aspire to be something other than American would be to renounce all of my ancestors' contributions to this country, along with their struggles, hard work, wealth, and love. And so, um, you know, Roger Wilkins is saying, you know, my, I have fathers and mothers buried in this soil. I am invested in this place, and I am going to uh, realize this American dream given the investments we have made in this place. On the iconoclastic side, let me pull from a quote from Frederick Douglass, and Frederick Douglass said this in 1848, at his, uh, 1848 in, a, in a address at Corinthian Hall. On the 4th of July, <laughs> Frederick Douglass and I know I think I've referenced this before with regards to his, his famous oration of what to the American slave is the 4th of July. And Frederick Douglass, in his sort of disillusioned uh, egalitarianism, he implored his audiences to tell him, what country have I? Is this, su in such a country as this, I have no patriotism. The only thing that links me to this land is my family and the painful consciousness that here are three millions of my fellow creatures groaning beneath the iron rod of the worst despotism that could be devised. So he says, now, I want to suggest to you that even though Frederick Douglass says he has no patriotism, he's pushing the audience to say, why in the heck would I be patriotic in a country that enslaves my people? Why? And so he really he's pushing the audience to say, what does patriotism mean if I am not free? That's really what Douglas is saying. Um, and so in all those ways, African Americans have struggled with this question of what does it mean to be lo a loyal and patriotic American? Well, let's think further about this American answer. And let me give you an example of invested patriotism. So when asked in questions that or surveys that were asked in 2015, 2002, and 2008, so I, I got questions across the span of the last several years. Um, the question was asked, how proud would you say you are to be an American citizen? The response of very proud to, ver to extremely proud. So 78% of African Americans in that sample in that survey said, yes, I'm very proud to be an American or extremely proud to be an American citizen. That's compared to 82% for their white co counterparts. So there's not that much a distance between African Americans and whites on that question. There's not, there's not a distance on the next question in the sense of majority approval, but there is some distance. So when you hear the national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner being played, do you usually feel proud to be an American? So the, not just uh, proud to be an American, but the trappings of patriotism. 72%, a solid majority of Americans say yes. We agree um, that we feel proud. But that's, uh, but 93% of whites do. And so what is that distinction? And that is, I'm sure that is a statistically significant difference. What does that distinction mean when it talks about the trappings of patriotism versus actual pride in one's country? And then in 2008, on, the, uh, on a black politics study out of Columbia University, it was asked the question, I am prouder to be America because of Barack Obama's then nomination to become the Democratic nominee uh, of the part of the uh, of the uh, Democratic nominee for president. And um, this question was asked during, before Obama was elected. Do you feel prouder because he was nominated? And a solid, you know, a majority of, of African Americans said yes. Um, I have to admit his being nominated does make me prouder of this country. Of course, Michelle Obama got in trouble <laughs> when she says, this is the first time I've, I have felt proud to be an American. Now, I think it was taken a bit out of context. Michelle 
Obama later would explain in her own memoir, it was a high point of pride for me, not the only point of pride I've ever felt in my country. But I have to admit that given the racial injustice and discrimination in my country, it has been a challenge for, for African Americans to feel pride. And so she tried to certainly put it in context. But only a third of whites felt such a pride in Obama's nomination. And maybe it's because not Barack Obama's nomination meant in some, something entirely different for at least a plurality of whites in that regard. But anyway, is this an invested patriotism? A solid majority of African Americans are equally invested in what it means to be an American according to one's sense of citizenship and pride. Although not necessarily all the symbols, not invested in all the symbols of patriotism in the same way. Just the trappings of patriotism per se. Substance versus trappings. <clears throat> then, um, how about iconoclastic patriotism? But African Americans believe bending a knee during the anthem pays appropriate respect to the anthem while protesting unjust police violence against the African Americans. Uh, and so again, the, the stark difference um, uh, blacks and whites had with regards to whether or not that act was a respectful act, but a necessary act to raise the fundamental injustice of police violence. And so um, this comes from a, um, a YouGov et al. poll. Uh, do you approve so you see at the top, do you approve or disapprove of football players protesting by kneeling during the national anthem? Uh, less than a quarter of whites, 70, nearly 75% of blacks. Do you think it's appropriate or inappropriate for the NFL players to kneel in protest during the national anthem? Less than a quarter of, uh, or roughly more than a quarter of whites, um, still a solid majority of blacks. Players in the NFL and other sports are kneeling or locking arms together during the national anthem to protest racial inequality in the United States. Do you consider this to be respectful or a disrespectful way to bring attention to their concerns? So again, less than a plurality of whites, even with that more tepid question in a solid 75% plus of blacks. So all the ways in which it says, listen, I am patriotic, but I know it requires more than mere patriotism to bring about the American dream against those things that are still fundamental bears for racial equality, particularly against African Americans. All right, so let's conclude by talking about the Du Bois's response to this double consciousness question. And I already gave you a heads up as to how Du Bois answered it uh, at the very end of his life when he was 93 years of age. Uh, by the way, Du Bois died the day before the March on Washington in 1963, which is, <laughs> you know, quite quite poignant and symbolic uh, for Du Bois to, to have died, to have begun, his life began during, um, so he lived to be 93 years old, and his life began um, at the, he, uh, or he was born in the midst of the period that would be essentially Reconstruction, and died before the height of the civil rights movement. So his life saw a significant span of African-American history and political history. Du Bois says, okay, here's how I would resolve. The history of the American Negro is the history of this strife of double consciousness. This longing to attain self-conscious manhood, we'll unpack that gender language later, but anyway, this longing to attach self-conscious manhood to merge this double self into a better and truer self. In this merging, he, the Negro, wishes neither of the older selves to be lost. He does not wish to Africanize America, for America has too much to teach the world in Africa. He wouldn't bleach his, his he wouldn't bleach his Negro blood in a flood of white Americanisms either. I, it's, it, it, to me, it's interesting that the boys use Africanized America versus white Americanisms. For he knows that the Negro's blood has a message for the world. He simply wishes to make it possible for a man to be both a Negro and American, an African and American, without being cursed and spat upon by his fellows, without having the doors of opportunity closed roughly in his face. Again, Du Bois saw this as a reconciling and emerging and synthesis of the two, although Du Bois's own answer at the end, I'm moving back to Africa. <laughs> okay, so, in class, we'll discuss, uh, we'll finish up our discussion of Nell Painter's chapter one. And now that we have all this context behind further discussing that chapter, we'll, so we'll, we'll finish that. And then here's the online questions I want you to answer. And you don't have to copy these down because I post them in Blackboard. 
But the first question is, what did Du Bois mean by double consciousness, the veil, and the gifts of black culture to America? That comes from the reading of Du Bois, of his, of his chapter. What are Africanisms? Do you think Herkovitz or Frazier uh, best describe what is true today for African American identity with Africa? Is it somewhat ironic that Herkovitz, excuse, excuse my misspelling, that's with an S, Herkovitz and Frazier assumed the different positions they did with regards to Africanisms? So you'll get that answer ha having read this on or listened to this online lecture. What is the difference between invested versus iconoclastic patriotism? Is, is one, um, if one is the more predominant form of black patriotism today, why do you think that is true? Is, is it the invested form of, of patriotism or iconoclastic form of patriotism that's the most predominant form? And if you think that one is more predominant, then, then why? And then, also from topic two, listen to this lecture, what do you think of Du Bois' solution to the double consciousness dilemma of black life? All right. So I want you to answer those four questions. Do it in a, a brief paragraph for each uh, and then submit your answers uh, by the deadline uh, that I have outlined. Next. Uh, so what, on Tuesday, along with Painter, um, in reference to those questions I just raised, then we're going to finish up the topic two readings, the discussion of the topic two readings. So definitely be sure you've read the, the Stewart, the Du Bois, and the Colts readings. Um, and I've been giving you a heads up, so it shouldn't be a surprise. <laughs> so I want you to have read those readings for topic two, and we're going to finish our discussion of those topic two readings on Tuesday. And then you'll submit the topic two uh, participation uh, online reading assignment. All right. Thank you very much. Um, and there are other parts of this lecture I didn't convey to you, but we, I'll convey them later on when they're uh, appropriate for other sections. So thank you very much for listening and um, be well. I'll see you in class.